All right, Ghana. It was the first West African empire who, through the control of trade, was able to last about 700 years. They gained power and influence through that control of trade. Um, most of the early writings we have on them are from Arab scholars of that time. So the first part is government. So it was called the fabled land of gold because of the um, pure amount of wealth that they had. It was fabled that the king even had some gold that was up to 40 pounds and even bigger. So some of it was like, for example, even big enough that to, it was said to be, have been able to tie a thing for his horse around it. So the king had all the power in this kingdom, in this empire. Sometimes he would appoint governors to rule over different parts of the kingdom um, because it was such a big kingdom. He held daily court meetings where he would essentially come in, sit down. The people would come in uh, one by one. He would hear out their cases and make a ruling. Whatever the king ruled would stand. Now, he would be announced by the pounding of drums. Also, this was not the typical kingdom, as it wouldn't be the son of the king who would inherit the kingdom, but rather his sister's oldest son. So his sister's son would inherit the kingdom, not his own son. For military, there was three different branches. Those three branches were the elite soldiers, the regular soldiers, and the reserves. Everyone was trained, didn't matter who you were, to fight. So that if the need arose, the king could call on you to increase his soldiers. It was said to even have maybe been able to call on at one point 200,000 soldiers. Uh, so the elite soldiers were mostly made up of people who were deemed to be courageous, honest, and intelligent. And they would make up the king's bodyguards, escorts, or even his military advisors. Moving over here, the source of the wealth came from, like I said, control of trade, specifically the Trans-Saharan trade which was the trade that happened between North Africa and South Africa where people had to cross through the Sahara, Sahara Desert. Um, the main things that the North traded were salt, copper, and cowrie. The main things that the South traded were koala nuts, hides, leather goods, ivory, slaves, and gold. The two main things that spurred the growth of the Ghana Empire was camels and the spread of the belief of Islam. So camels were extremely efficient when it comes to traversing the desert. So in 3000, sorry, 300 BCE, when camels were introduced, they helped out quite a bit in expanding trade. They were efficient for the desert because they had double eyelashes which helped keep the sand that would blow out of their eyes and they could drink and store up to 25 gallons of water in their stomachs which were located on their back which is why camels have two humps. Because of camels and the spread of Islam they were able to establish caravan routes. Uh, the spread of Islam was especially important because whereas there would be attacks from neighboring Islam countries that wouldn't actually take over the Sahara or Ghana, but rather many people 
from those Muslim countries that would attack would end up stopping and settling down there. So, also, because of the amount of wealth, this is where many of Rome got their coins that they minted that had the Roman emperor on it. Um, travel south was especially rough. Um, the early accounts um, said how severe the weather and stuff were. They had to travel from oasis to oasis. In fact, they would often stop right at the beginning of the Sahara Desert to switch over to camels. And then once they got to their destination, right at the end of the desert again, they would switch back to donkeys and often hire uh, porters to help them transport their goods the rest of the way. Many people died along the path. In fact, uh, things like, for example, if they ran out of water because they would travel from oasis to oasis, but if they couldn't find an oasis in the desert, which was a place with water and stuff, then they had to try to make do with whatever they did have, which in the account in the book, the gentleman even ends up cutting open some of his camels to drink the water out of their stomach. All right, so the gold salt trade. They were the two most important in-demand items for different reasons. So gold was especially powerful and important because well, it was always a symbol of wealth, but especially with trade for China. So different countries wanted to trade with China, but they would only accept gold. And China's main resources that they had that everybody wanted was the silk and the porcelain. Uh, next is the Wangaran secret, which at the time was that the Wangaras, did, people didn't share where their gold mines were. So, essentially, nobody except for their people knew, and therefore, they were able to control that trade. Now, a lot of times, the king, who we spoke about earlier of Ghana, would be the only one allowed to have actual gold nuggets. Everybody else only had gold powder. So, the need for salt because salt is very common today, but back then it wasn't as common. But it was heavily needed for perspiration, which means when you start to lose uh, water in your body due to sweat, you need salt to replace it. People also use salt for preservation purposes, meaning that they keep their food good with it. People like the taste. And also they would use it to feed their animals. Uh, Tengaza was a one of the main places where salt was mined from. It was only good for salt. It was a really desolate place that without the salt mines, nobody would be there. Slave labor was the main source of labor there. However, the slaves are mostly owned by Arab people. Um, sometimes the miners in the uh, Tengaza uh, salt mines would starve, especially because it relied heavily on trade, meaning that there was no food resources there. So if traders didn't come, they weren't able to eat and they would starve. Now, taxes from the Ghana Empire, people would be taxed both on upon entering the Sahara Desert and upon leaving the Sahara Desert. The two most tax items were salt and gold. However, anything that got brought through would be taxed. So there was multiple benefits from this. So the Kingdom of Ghana benefited because it got improved armies. It was able to lead attacks against other people and conquer other people because of the wealth brought in from the uh, tax on trade. It made them extremely wealthy and it allowed them to control that area. So merchants also really appreciated it because it allowed 
for the kingdom of Ghana to provide soldiers which provided protection against outside bandits and such that would potentially try to come and steal their goods from their caravan. Exchange mostly happened in the town of Kumbai. It had many different merchants selling many different goods. Um, it was also known as the largest slave market of the time. So people would trade in Kumbai by a method called silent trade. So the way that silent trade worked was that they never met. And essentially what would happen is the traders would come. They would lay out all of their goods along the river. And then they would beat the drum. That would let the... Uh, People from um, Wangara know that they could come and place their offering of gold in exchange. So if once they did that, they would then beat the drum and then they would leave. The trader would come back. If the offer was acceptable, then they would beat the drum. If it wasn't, they would leave, and the Wangaras would come back and place more gold to make a new offer. Sometimes these would last for days. So there was two advantages. One is that people that spoke different languages could essentially be able to trade, and two, was that the Wangara, who had that big secret of where their gold mines were, could keep their secret. So the thing is, is people even at some point tried to capture the Wangara and gold miners to torture them into giving up where the gold mines were, but most of the time the people would rather die than give up where those gold mines were. So the decline of the Ghana Kingdom was for a couple different reasons. One, after some time, resources began to dry up, so things like water, trees, all that kind of stuff because of the multiple wars and the growth of the population, the resources began to dry up in the area. Another thing that led to the downfall was various attacks from outside neighboring countries. So, Kumbai was the first to fall that led to the downfall. So, that also led to the rise of Mali, which was held a lot of people who believed in the Muslim faith. Now, because of the lack of the Ghana Empire, it left a power void, which is what the Mali people, the people of Mali, filled. These were people called the Mande people at the time, before they became the inhabitants of Mali, it was a nearby neighboring town. So that is the kingdom of Ghana, in a nutshell. Of course, there's more, but you'll have to do the reading to get the rest.